In the late 1950s, the winds of liberation swept across Africa as people throughout the continent sought freedom from their colonial masters. Nowhere was this transformation felt more significantly than in the vast territory of the Congo. Since the 1880s, the Congo had endured the chains of European exploitation. Initially serving as the private property of King Leopold II, who ruthlessly exploited his people through forced labor, plundering the resources for personal gain, it became a Belgian colony in 1908. While Belgian rule brought certain improvements to the standard of living in the Congo, the indigenous people desired true liberation. The man at the forefront of this liberation was none other than Patri Semere Lumumba. With fervor in his voice and dreams of a united nation, he rallied his compatriots towards a new era. Finally, on the 30th of June 1960, the Congo achieved independence and Patrice Lumumba became its first Prime Minister. However, the path to genuine liberation soon proved treacherous. Beneath the surface, hidden forces of exploitation and division lurked, eagerly waiting to sow seeds of discord. In less than a week after independence, the nation was plunged into turmoil when the Congolese military force, the first public, mutinied against their Belgian commanders. Things took a turn for the worse as the regions of Katanga and South Kasai, primarily supported by Belgium, declared their secession from the country. Charismatic figures like Moise Jombe in Katanga and Albert Kalonji in South Kasai spearheaded these secessionist movements. Poised to maintain national unity, Lumumba sought assistance from the United Nations and the United States. However, despite deploying troops to the region, the UN maintained a passive stance, offering only peacekeeping support and refusing to be involved in quelling the rebellion. Similarly, the United States declined to offer Lumumba direct assistance, indicating that aid would be channeled through the UN. Frustrated by this, the Prime Minister turned to the Soviet Union for intervention. Lumumba received weapons and advisors from the Soviets, which he utilized to quell the rebellion in South Kasai. Unfortunately, this suppression resulted in the massacres of the native Baluba people of Southern Kasai. Following this, Congolese President Joseph Kasavubu decided to depose Lumumba and dissolve his administration. He appoints Senior President Joseph Ilio as Prime Minister. However, upon hearing the news, Lumumba in return deposed Kasavubu. Amidst this turmoil, an astute and ambitious military officer by the name of Colonel Joseph Mobutu seized the opportunity to consolidate his power and orchestrate a coup to remove both Lumumba and Kasavubu from office until the end of the year. Tragically, Lumumba's fate took a turn for the worse as Mobutu placed him under house arrest. Seeing that a new government comprising his loyal followers was being formed in the country's eastern region, Lumumba decided to flee the capital and join them. However, while on his way, Mobutu's troops caught up with him and arrested him. In the end, Lumumba was subsequently transferred to the secessionist state of Katanga, where his life would meet an untimely and brutal end on January 17, 1961. After the death of Lumumba, Colonel Mobutu reinstated Kasavubu and Joseph Ilio as President and Prime Minister, respectively. In return, Kasavubu elevated the Colonel to the rank of Major General. Subsequently, Mobutu executed several Lumumba supporters charged with crimes against the Baluba nation. Amongst them was John Pierre Finot, the first President of the Oriental Province. In retaliation, Antoine Gizenga, the former Deputy Prime Minister of the Congo and a staunch supporter of Lumumba, who had now consolidated power in the Oriental Province, commanded his soldiers to shoot 15 political prisoners loyal to Mobutu. 
This group included Alpha Songolo, the former Minister of Communications, and Gilbert Pierre Pongo, the individual responsible for capturing Lumumba. In February 1961, the Congo had split into four factions. Antoine Gizenga's Free Republic of the Congo, centered in Stalinville, the government of Kasabubu and Mobutu, based in the capital city of Leopoldville, Moise Jombe's independent state of Katanga, with its capital in Elizabethville, and the government of South Kasai, led by Albert Kelonji, and based in the city of Bakwanga. Following the disintegration of the central government and Katanga's continued reliance on foreign mercenaries, the United Nations bolstered and expanded its peacekeeping force across the Congo. On the 21st of February 1961, the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 161 granting the mandate to restore order, avert an impending civil war, and ensure the immediate arrest and departure of all foreign military personnel and mercenaries from the country. However, the Katangese government disregarded the resolution and formulated plans to quell the rebellion in its northern region. You see, the Baluba population residing in northern Katanga had been opposed to Shombe's secession from the very beginning. This area was the stronghold of the political party known as the Balubakat. It was led by a man by the name of J.C. Senwe. Since October 1960, Northern Katanga had been designated as a neutral zone under the control of Unok contingents. But in reality, the UN troops stationed there were too weak to effectively exercise their authority. Previously, the Balubakat rebels had mistakenly ambushed an 11-man section of Irish Onok troops at Niembe, resulting in the unfortunate death of nine Irish soldiers. The rebels had mistaken the UN troops for mercenaries affiliated with the Katangese gendarmerie. Towards the end of February, Moise Chombe began an offensive to suppress the Baluba opposition in northern Katanga. He deployed approximately 5,000 troops from his Katangese gendarmerie to Lubudi. Simultaneously, they aimed to retake the town of Manono, secure the southern area, and launched attacks from Kabalo in Abeltville in the east and Kongolo in the north. Leading the Balubakat rebels in Manono was a man by the name of Laurent Desiree Kabila. Subsequently, the Katangese gendarmerie launched Operation Banquets, Mambo, and Lotus against the Balubakat rebels and successfully captured Manono in March. Following this, the Katangese gendarmerie then redirected their focus to Kabalo, but the town was occupied by Onok troops from Ethiopia. On April the 7th, a Katangese plane carrying 30 mercenaries attempted to secure the town's airstrip. But when they landed, they were promptly apprehended by the Onok troops. In the meantime, Katangese ground forces, commanded by Colonel Jean Marie Kervecure, continued to engage the Balubakat militia. They encountered formidable resistance from the Balubakat rebels, which hindered their repeated attempts to enter the city of Kabalu. Eventually, on the 11th of April, Katangese troops withdrew from the area and shifted their focus to operations further south. On August the 2nd, Cyril Adula succeeded Joseph Ilio as Prime Minister of the Kasavubu Mobutu government in Leopoldville. He adopted a significantly more assertive approach towards resolving the Katangi secession. That same month, Antoine Gizenga, the leader of the Free Republic of the Congo, consented to rejoin the Congolese government as Deputy Prime Minister, following extensive negotiations between the two parties. However, he opted to remain in Stalinville. Following the latest mandate from the UN Security Council, Onok officials made efforts to secure cooperation from the Katangese government regarding the expulsion of mercenaries from Katanga. Unfortunately, 
they faced limited progress as Shombe and his subordinates actively resisted the departure of the foreign troops. After careful consideration of the situation, the UN Secretariat concluded that if Shombe failed to comply with their request, foreign officers of the Katangis Gendarmerie would be forcibly arrested and deported. The UN officials hoped that a display of force would persuade the Katangis government to cooperate. However, Shombe remained undeterred. As a result, the UN began to plan a military operation codenamed Operation Rum Punch targeted towards the foreign gendarmes. On August 27, Colonel Cruz O'Brien, the UN Special Representative in Katanga, conveyed a meeting with key owner commanders in Elizabethville to outline plans for the arrest of foreign military personnel in Katanga. The strategy involved seizing the post office and radio station, followed by establishing a condone around the residence of the Katangis Minister of Interior, Godfred Monongo, to impede any coordinated resistance from the Katangis. Originally scheduled for August 29th, the operation was advanced by 24 hours to maintain tactical surprise as directed by its commander, Brigadier General K.A.S. Raja. At about 4 a.m. on August 28th, Operation Rum Punch began. Two companies of the Indian Regiment seized control of the radio station, resulting in the arrest of two Belgian mercenaries. Simultaneously, Ghanaian troops surrounded a mercenary camp near the shores of Lake Tangayika in northeastern Katanga. This camp was commanded by a French mercenary by the name of Bob Denard. Denard's men initially desired to fight, but they received radio orders to surrender. By the end of the day, 81 foreign members of the Katangis Gendarmerie had been apprehended and taken to the Kamina Air Base to await deportation. Operation Rum Punch had come to an end, but still, numerous foreign officers managed to evade deportation. One notable example was a French Lieutenant Colonel by the name of Roger Freck, who now assumed the position of Chief of Staff of the Katangis Army. Since Operation Rum Punch did not bring an end to the mercenary crisis in Katanga, several ONOC officials began to devise a more forceful operation to assert the authority. On September the 13th, ONOC initiated Operation Mortar. This intensified operation, building upon the foundation of Rum Punch, would trigger a significant eight-day military clash between the UN troops and the Katangis forces. This time, Shombe's mercenaries were well prepared and mounted successful counterattacks, resulting in the loss of 13 UN troops and over 200 Katangis civilians and soldiers. While UN forces managed to seize various outposts around Elizabethville and made attempts to apprehend Shombe, miscommunications amongst their commanders allowed Shombe to evade capture and escape to Northern Rhodesia. As Operation Morto unfolded, Katangi soldiers launched a counter-attack on an isolated unit of Irish UN troops in the mining town of Jadotville. This significant event came to be known as the Siege of Jadotville. Consisting of 155 men, the Irish A Company, under the command of Colonel Pat Quillan, had been deployed to Jadotville a few weeks earlier to assist in safeguarding the town's residents. But at about 7.40 a.m. on Wednesday, September the 13th, Katangi soldiers launched a sudden assault on the Irish troops who were attending an open-air mass. Private Billy Reddy, an Irish sentry, detected the threat and fired a warning shot alerting the company to the impending attack. Consequently, the Katangi gendarmes launched repeated attacks, steady waves of about 600 troops while subjecting the Irish positions to heavy bombardment from 81mm mortars. However, the fire from the Irish positions proved effective 
enabling them to neutralize most of the Katangese mortar and artillery positions. These intense fightings persisted for five days, during which a small relief force consisting of Irish, Indian, and Swedish troops made valiant attempts to reach the besieged soldiers in Jadotville. Regrettably, the Katangese gendarmes, led by French, German, Belgian, and South African mercenaries, repelled the advances. Outgunned and outnumbered by the Katangese, the besieged Irish soldiers radioed their headquarters. We will hold out until our last bullet is spent. Could do with some whiskey. By now, the Katangese forces had suffered significant losses and approached Quillen to propose a ceasefire. Quillen accepted the offer. However, the lack of communication between Quillen and his superiors resulted in a violation of the ceasefire agreement by the Katangese. Lacking ammunition and food, and with no clear orders or promise of assistance from his superiors, Quillen and his A Company surrendered to the Katangese on Sunday, September the 17th, 1961. The Irish soldiers were taken hostage for approximately one month before their eventual release. Remarkably, throughout the siege, soldiers from the Irish A Company inflicted around 1,300 casualties, including 300 fatalities on the Congolese forces without suffering any losses within their ranks. Onok's acts of violence during Operation Mortar did not sit well with the international community. As a result, UN Secretary Dag Amak Scholz began plans to negotiate a ceasefire between the UN forces and the Katangese troops. Unfortunately, tragedy struck on September the 18th while he was on his way to Northern Rhodesia to meet with Moise Chombe. His Douglas DC-6 airliner crashed near Undola, killing him and all 15 other passengers on board. The circumstances during the crash raised suspicions leading to speculations about a possible foul play or sabotage. However, a 1962 Rhodesian inquiry attributed it to pilot error. A few days later, a ceasefire was established between the two parties and Tant assumed the role of the new Secretary General of the United Nations. In stark contrast to Amag Schultz's moderate approach in the Congo, Utant endorsed a more radical stance and called for direct involvement in the conflict. On the morning of Saturday, November the 11th, two C-119 aircraft manned by the Italian air crew of Onok took off from the capital city of Leopoldville en route to Port in Pain, Kindu. They were tasked with providing supplies for the small Malaysian unit responsible for controlling the airfield in that area. Due to the unrest caused by Gizenga's troops moving from Stanleyville towards Katanga, the region posed a significant danger for the Europeans. However, the Italian air crew did not plan to stay there for too long, except for unloading the aircraft and having a brief lunch before flying back to base. In the days leading up to this, tensions had been unusually high amongst Kizinga's soldiers in the region. The Stanleyville troops, located 500 kilometers to the south in northern Katanga, had been targeted by Katangis aircraft bombings for months. Rumors had also begun to circulate about an impending airdrop by the Katangis army. Shortly after 2 p.m., the Congolese soldiers spotted the two Italian aircraft in the sky, intensifying their fear and suspicion. Upon landing, Gezinger's troop comprising men from the 20th Stalinville Battalion jumped into trucks bound for the airfield. When they arrived, the 12 Italian air crews and their commanding officer, Major Amadio Pemegiani, were having lunch with the leader of the Malaysian garrison. Facing assault from the Congolese soldiers, the Italians tried to barricade themselves in the building 
but were soon overpowered and taken prisoner. The first to die was medic Tenete Remolti, who was shot while trying to escape. The remaining 12 were brutally assaulted and loaded into two trucks. The entire Italian air crew was then finished off at docks and then cannibalized by a local crowd. They had been falsely accused of aiding the Katangi secessionists. Throughout October and November, Shombe continued to reinforce the Katangi's gendarmerie with additional mercenaries, ammunition, and aircraft. The UN had become increasingly enraged with the continued Katangi's resistance and their unwillingness to hand over their mercenaries even after Operations Rum Punch and Mortar. As a result, on November the 24th, the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 169 rejecting Katanga's claim to statehood and authorizing the peacekeeping troops to use all necessary force to assist the central government in restoring and maintaining law and order. Furthermore, the Council authorized the Secretary General to take whatever action necessary to immediately apprehend and deport all foreign military personnel and prevent their return. Certainly, every reasonable step should be taken to prevent the gendarmerie from becoming a lawless and undisciplined military organization. Four days later, a skirmish broke out between the Indian Onok troops and the Katangis gendarmes at the Elizabethville airport, resulting in the detention and disarmament of the Katangi soldiers. As a result, the gendarmes saw this as the beginning of a new Onok offensive and mounted a roadblock along the route to the Swedish Onok camp in Elizabethville. Onok's military commander for South Katanga, Colonel Johans Vein, called numerous Katangi officials to have the road cleared, but he received evasive responses. The next day, John Dumps attacked and killed a Swedish soldier, injuring two others when they attempted to pass through the roadblock. In response, Evan Smith, the UN representative, issued warnings to all Katangese forces urging them to withdraw to their barracks. But once more, the Katangese authorities ignored the warning. On the 4th of December, Smith and the commander of all UN forces in Katanga, Brigadier K.A.S. Raja, visited various UNOC outposts and encouraged patience amongst the troops. They emphasized that no action could be taken against the Katangese forces without the permission of the Security Council. But soon, they were completely gobsmacked to realize that the Katangese Jodoms had set up three additional roadblocks, effectively isolating them from the city center. After numerous phone calls from Smith, Ivariste Kimba, the Katangese foreign minister who assumed government responsibilities in Shombe's absence, made a promise to remove the roadblocks by 6 p.m. However, by the following morning, it became evident to the UN forces that the roadblocks would remain and that Kimba had no authority over the Katangese gendarmerie. Furthermore, the Katangese forces began to use the roadblocks to isolate honor camps from each other and cut off the UN position at the airport. Following this, Utant became convinced that urgent military action should be taken to restore Onok's freedom of movement. Immediate orders were issued to Raja and his troops began taking up positions in proximity to the Katangese roadblocks. At about 12.15 pm on December the 5th, UN troops stationed in Katanga launched Operation Unocat. The operation was aimed at securing freedom of movement for Onok personnel. In the initial phase, Indian Onok troops under the command of Brigadier K.A.S. Raja launched an attack to dismantle the Gendarmerie roadblock on the highway between their location and Elizabethville. With the support of Irish and Swedish troops, they successfully cleared the road using armored cars. Following this achievement, the troops proceeded to establish their own roadblock. However, when a platoon led by Captain Gobachan Salaria attempted to link up with the roadblock, 
they were assaulted by 19 gendarmes accompanied by two armored vehicles. Displaying exceptional bravery, Salaria and his troops engaged in a bayonet charge driving the gendarmes from their positions. As a result, the Katangis suffered immense losses compared to the Indians. But tragically, Salaria did not survive the operation. That same day, a Katangis plane bombed the Elizabethville airport while the Irish contingent camp came under heavy sniper fire. In response, Onox Kambara bombers conducted a raid on the Kowesi airstrip, destroying several Katangis aircraft in the process. Over the following days, the UN troops continued to launch attacks on multiple targets across Katanga. The troops focused on specific locations aiming to disrupt Katangis reinforcement efforts, and by December the 8th, they had achieved air superiority over Katanga. Subsequently, on December the 15th, UN troops initiated a comprehensive offensive to seize control of the center of Elizabethville and block the Katangis escape routes to the west. Throughout the evening and the following day, the Ethiopian contingent fought through the Lido area, effectively obstructing Katangis escape paths to Kipuchi and Rhodesia. Simultaneously, Irish and Swedish troops secured the industrial district and formulated a major assault targeting Cap Marciat, the primary base of the Katangis Gendarmerie. In the early hours of Saturday, December the 16th, a torrential tropical downpour engulfed the heavily fortified main base of the Katangis Gendarmerie at Camp Marciat. Despite the challenging condition, Onok troops commanded by Colonel Johans Vein decided to launch an assault on the camp. At the time of the attack, three companies of the Katangis Gendarmerie were stationed there. The attack began at about 3.40 am. The UN troops, consisting of the Swedish and the Irish battalions, initiated a 35-minute bombardment of the camp using mortars. Following the intense mortar barrage, a relentless shower of about 940 grenades rained down upon the camp. Although the Katangis responded with heavy fire from mortars, machine guns and snipers positioned on the upper floors of the buildings, the UN troops continued to press forward. Eventually, the Swedish unit managed to seize control of the main entrance. However, the gendarmes regrouped and launched a fierce counter-attack, engaging the Swedes in intense hand-to-hand -hand combat. Nevertheless, by 1 pm, the Swedes successfully repelled all attacks and asserted complete control over the Katangis stronghold. Resultingly, by December the 18th, Onok troops had nearly complete control of Elizabethville, with the exception of Shombe's presidential palace and the headquarters of the Belgian mining company Union Minier. Thereafter, Wu Tant declared a unilateral temporary ceasefire, prompting Shombe to begin negotiations with the central government. On the 20th of December, with guarantees of protection from the United States and the United Nations, Shombe agreed to meet with representatives of the Congolese central government at the Kituna Air Base. At about 2.30 am the following day, Shombe agreed to sign an eight-point document called the Kitona Declaration. This declaration effectively renounced Katanga's secession. Upon receiving news of Shombe's signature, Tant confirmed the UN ceasefire. However, Shombe would later postpone this agreement and delay any reconciliatory actions. Meanwhile, in Stalinville, Kizenga and his troops faced intense pressure from the central government and the UN following the murder of the 13 Italian UNOC troops in Kindu. In early January 1962, the Congolese parliament passed a resolution demanding Gezenga's return to Leopoldville, the disbandment of his militia, and the establishment of a special commission to restore central authority in the Oriental province. But Gezenga refused to budge an inch. 
Consequently, clashes broke out between the central forces and Gizinga's loyalists, resulting in multiple fatalities. However, order was finally restored after Unok troops intervened. Thereafter, the Lula's forces promptly surrounded Gizinga's residence and placed him under house arrest. Now stripped of his vice premiership, Gizinga was eventually imprisoned, marking the end of his free republic in the Congo. Similarly, the downfall of South Kasai would begin three months later in April 1962 after the UN troops occupied the region as part of Utan's aggressive stance against cessation. Its leader, Albert Kelonji, who had previously been imprisoned, escaped and returned to the region aiming to regain his official position as the head of the Kasayan government. However, in September 1962, the satisfied military commanders in South Kasai, influenced by their former Prime Minister Joseph Ngalula, staged a coup against Kalonji and placed him under house arrest. Kalonji would once again escape, fleeing to Katanga before ultimately settling in Spain. Finally, in October 1962, central government troops entered the capital city of Bakwanga, effectively marking the end of the secessionist state of South Kasai. Back in Katanga, it had become evident to the UN that Shombe had no intention of rejoining the Congo. The number of mercenaries in Katanga had increased to about 500 and new airfields and defensive positions were being constructed. Furthermore, Onok personnel continued to face increasing harassment at the hands of the Katangese gendarmes. The situation reached a breaking point on December the 24th when the Katangese brazenly attacked the Ethiopian peacekeeping force and shot down an unarmed Onok helicopter. Responding to the growing hostility from the Katangese forces, the UN Security Council authorized a retaliatory offensive aimed at securing Elizabethville and crushing the Katangese secession. The offensive was codenamed Operation Grand Slam. Under the command of Major General Dewan Prem Chand, Operation Grand Slam commenced on the afternoon of December the 28th. The operation originally planned in three phases, was ultimately completed in two. On the first day of the operation, UN forces killed about 50 gendarmes, successfully securing downtown Elizabethville, the local gendarmerie headquarters, the radio station, and Shombe's presidential palace. The next day, Onok Air Division launched a surprise assault on the Kowesi airfield. Meanwhile, the Ethiopian unit advanced along the Kipushi Road to sever the Katangese communication lines in Rhodesia. During the night, Irish troops captured the town of Kipushi without encountering any opposition. With subsequent assistance from the Malaysian and Nigerian Onok forces, the UN peacekeeping troops successfully secured the final Katangese stronghold in Kowesi. Consequently, on the 15th of January 1963, Shombe formally sent a message to Tant. I'm ready to immediately proclaim before the world that Katanga's secession is over. Two days later, on January the 17th, he met with UN officials in Elizabethville and signed a formal instrument of surrender, officially bringing an end to the Katangese secession. The victory military total de l'ONU ne peut finalement pas bénéficier au peuple congolais. Par conséquent, nous sommes prêts à proclamer immédiatement devant le monde que la sécession katangaise est terminée. Thereafter, a new constitution called the Low Labor Constitution was established. It expanded the powers of the presidency, abolished the system of joint consultation between the president and the prime minister, and increased the number of provinces from six to 21. The country was also renamed the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Subsequently, Shombe would go into exile in northern Rhodesia before settling in Spain. Similarly, 
his remaining gendarmes would be relegated to neighboring Angola. Following Katanga's integration, UN forces in the Congo significantly reduced, leaving only a small peacekeeping contingent in the country. However, the final group of peacekeepers departed on the 30th of June 1964. The last Onok soldier to leave the Congo was the Nigerian UN Force Commander Major General Johnson Agwe Ironsi. While the fall of Katanga brought an end to the secessionist movement, it did not completely resolve the underlying issues that foiled the conflict. The Democratic Republic of the Congo would continue to grapple with the enduring legacy of division and mistrust, exerting a profound influence on its political landscape. Within a few months after Katanga's fall, the Congo would be plunged into the throes of two significant rebellions shaking the very foundations of its regional stability. But that, my friends, is a story for another time. <laughs>